to you tomorrow. So, so you know, I'm lazy. Two hours in a row is more than enough for me. So we need to fill a little bit of time tomorrow as well. So, uh, okay. Exercise three, thirty percent. Table one above gives uh, match outcome probabilities for two thought football teams N and B conditioned on strategical choices N and A for the N team and B and N for the B team. So there is two football teams, one named with an script N, the other one named with a script B. Now this script means that you kind of write, you don't write the N like this, but you write it like this, okay? Just to separate the teams from the strategies, I use different alphabets, so to speak. And there is some numbers for the probabilities here. Of course, these probabilities should sum to 1 in each line, because there is a probability of NB, a probability of BN, and a probability of D. And we need to know the meaning of this, okay? The probability of BNB means the probability that team N meet, uh, beats team B. So, um, this 0 0.8 means that in 80 out of 100 matches, given these combined strategic choices, the N team beats the B team. While this one is the opposite probability, the probability that team N beats team B, and that's only 10 out of 100, or 0 0.1, 10%. And finally, then there is draw probability. Of course, that can be calculated, given that these two are known, because they should always sum to 1. And the first question here, which of the teams would you, based on the information in table 1, assume to be the best? And if you look at these probabilities, you see that the N team has a higher probability of beating the B team than the opposite in the first line. There are equal probabilities in the second line, uh, given in the third line. Th again, the N team has a bigger probability of beating the B team than the opposite. And they are equal again in the fourth line. So in two of these strategical situations, N team is best in two others, they are equally good. So uh, a reasonable assumption given these numbers is that we can say that the B team is better, sorry, the N team is better than the B team. And then it says in B, explain through a couple of examples how the information in table 1 can be used to construct the game matrix in figure 2 on next side. So there is a figure 2, yeah, here is a figure 2. And this is kind of uh, the same exercise, more or less, as we had in the previous exam, isn't it? It's almost the same. There's a little difference in the questions, but it seems to be fairly equal. So the idea then is to know here, based on reading our curriculum, that um, we normally apply some kind of point score rule in order to evaluate or find expected payoffs. So in the first line here, if there is a, find a game matrix now we need to calculate expected payoffs based on some point score mechanism or point score scheme. Now we really don't know what has been done here, but it seems to be such that it's the 3, 1, 0 system, which is the normal one which has been used here. And if we check and take 0 0.8, the probability that team N 
beats team B in that case they get three points and there is uh, of course a possibility of losing which pr produces zero points but there is a draw probability which has probability of 0 0.1 and if you multiply that by 1 we get 2.4 here plus 0 0.1 which is 2.5 and if you look at the figure we see that 2.5 is here and of course if you want to check another one it says a couple a couple is at least two isn't it so we can do the same with the same strategy for the other team so this is for the N team and the N team was by this script and we can do the same for the B team in that case there is a problem of 0 0.1 wasn't it that ah. why didn't that work a 0 0.1 probability that the B team beats the N team in the first line of course they still get three points and there is still the same draw probability this is 0 0.3 plus 0 0.1 which is 0 0.4 which also corresponds with the number it should that number okay so now we have shown how to find this number and that number all the other numbers are of course calculated in the same way but you have to to, ch to change your line in the table so in order to find the rest of the numbers here you have to run through this table not only using these numbers but these these and those numbers in order to fill the table so that was the answer to question b and then in c find all Nash equilibria in the game they are kind of already set up for us here while because these circles and squares are put in already we should perhaps check that they are correct 2.5 is bigger than 1.45 that produces this circle 1.6 is bigger than 1.33 that produces that circle 1 is bigger than 0 0.4 produces that square 145 is bigger than 133 produces that square and we see then that there is a single route here or single square where we have both a cir small circle and a small square so the Nash equilibrium is here and as long as we have a 2x2 two two game there is only one and so it's uh, a uni unique one and it means that Norway, if that's how we interpret it here, should play choose the end strategy while Belarus should also choose the end strategy and this is kind of the mimic example we, we looked at in the text so what's next here? yeah, that was C, there's a single Nash equilibrium as shown here just uh, write that down explain how it why it could be sensible for team N to reduce its own quality in playing a strategy N and the reason for that we discussed more in detail last time because then we actually made some calculations on it in this, ex in this exercise we are not asked to perform such calculations but just explain why it could be sensible and the reason, or the explanation I'm searching for here, is that, okay, we see here that we end up here. So Norway ends up with an expected point score of 1.6. Normally too little to reach any end place, isn't it? We need to typically be about two. Where are we at the moment? We have nine points in four matches. Nine divided by four, how much is that? 2.4 is eight. Nine minus eight is one. Do we have 2.5? No, we don't have 2.5. I can't even divide numbers anymore. 10 divided by 4 is 2. Yeah, 20, 2.25 is the, um, the point score per match for the Norwegian national team at the moment. Uh, a little bit below the Moldes uh, captured this year because Molde got. 71 over 30, didn't they? How much is this? You have a calculator, Christian, on your Mac? Can you? I think it's 2.35 or something. Does it? Is it that slow? 
better to use the iPhone then. Yeah, ah, but I have a calculator here, don't I? I should have one somewhere. Let's, um, there it is. Okay. 71. 227? 37. 37, yeah, okay. Uh, so slightly better than 2.25, but not that much, okay? So just from the point scoring, Norway looks nice. Of course, they have only met, uh, had one match against a really good team. There's still three very hard matches left. Okay, a digression. But the point here uh, was, of course, that uh, when you only get 1.6 here, it is tempting to kind of reach this Nash equilibrium. But in order to reach this Nash equilibrium, you have to take this number down and at the same time taking that one up. You achieve that by taking this line of probabilities. In order to take this number down and that number up, you will have to take probability here and move it over here. And we looked into these numbers. It, it had to be 0 0.65 or something here, I think, to kind of get the optimal. But you reduce these. At the same time, increasing that one. Then this number goes down. This number goes up. And when the number here goes up enough that it's bigger than that one, then this square is moved over here. And the Nash equilibrium moves from this point into this point. And the idea then, of course, is that you, you don't change it too much but exactly enough in such a way that you're still bigger than that one and it turns out that you can reach 1.9 or something i think to to uh, by doing this operation so that is the explanation of why it may be sensible for Nova in this case to be worse than they really are okay being worse than you really are is really simple for a, a coach isn't it you, you, you just don't have to pick the best players, that is a very easy strategy to achieve that, but uh, picking not the best players, given that the best players are available and not hurt, is a tough strategy to do, and you're not even allowed to do it, do you know that? At least in most tournaments, at least in the Champions League, there is a rule that says that you have to, to play with the best team you can. So in order to achieve these targets, you must use more strong means, okay? You must be certain that the best players get injured. So you have to break their foots, actually, to not breaking the rules. But of course, there is other ways of doing this, okay? You can tell the players that, okay, yeah. You can take the players on time before the match, give them some, some liquor and beer, and let them drink as much as they like. There's a lot of options here, okay? to kind of achieve this in, in case you really want to do it. Okay, that was the exam from 2010. Do we have any questions? No questions. Okay, then we move to the next one. Start that one before we end for today. Uh, now, if you looked at the first two exams here, oh, what happened here? Weird. Ah, good. They were kind of similar. There was a penalty kick exercise, there was one about this team play, and there was a kind of more uh, in the middle type of exercise. Now, in this exam, of course, uh, as it's in game theory, we must try to make the exercise for the exam unpredictable for the students, okay? So after giving two exams that kind of looked like each other, then I made a different one, okay? Just to make sure that the students at your stage you know, cannot kind of try speculating what kind of exercise to get, okay? So you must kind of be prepared for anything. So let's look at this 2000 and 2011 exam. This was the solutions. I want the exam. Here it is. So here it's uh, uh, sufficiently different from the other exams to kind of make the point, I think. We start easy, explain the differences between simultaneous and sequ sequential game. This is kind of more like game theory, but it's of course linked strongly to the football content here, so uh, the answer should be straightforward. The simultaneous game 
is played when the players of the game are not able to observe the strategic choices for from their opponent before they have to make their decision. Well, in a sequential game, uh, one of the players makes his moves observed by the other player before he or she makes her moves. And then it moves like this. The chess is a classical example of a se sequential game. Very observe. Could it be possible to play chess simultaneously? Not necessarily. And why? There are, cert there are certain moves that are not possible, okay? So if I kind of make up my mind on making a certain move, and it could be that that move depends on that my opponent do not move his pieces in such a way that it's possible for me to make that move, okay? So that makes uh, chess hard to play simultaneously. But of course, in principle, these kind of games could be played simultaneously. Monopoly is a simultaneous game, isn't it? Each player dr uh, draws the dice and then moves his car. Could that could perhaps be played simultaneously, although it wouldn't matter much, would it? Because the main point in Monopoly is perhaps not that much that. Everybody makes the moves at the same time without observing. Of course, you can count up who is on um, at my hotels and take the money, so you could play that without actually much change. So the structure of the game kind of says whether it's possible to play a sequential game simultaneously or the other way around, if you like. But this was again a digression. So we the, well our own aim here was to explain the difference between these two concepts, simultaneously and sequential. And I think we did that. Then there is a text. Discuss and place the following sub-games, or Dale Spill in Norwegian, in football, into the two classes mentioned above. Okay, so we define two different classes, a simultaneous class and a sequential class, and then we pick up some situations in football, and the idea then is to try to put each of these football situations into either the simultaneous or the sequential category. Now we have already discussed penalty kicks, haven't we? And we kind of uh, said that that could uh, look like a, a simultaneous game, so, uh, so these two won here is perhaps good to put into this category. We have discussed free kicks as well, haven't we? They seem to be such that uh, uh, the team who has gotten the free kick can observe the movements of their opponent before they make the move. So a free kick is perhaps a sequential game. So two of these sub-games or uh, parts of football have already been discussed and placed. What about a throw-in? A throw-in is like a free kick, isn't it? I have the ball, I wait and see what the opponents do, what players they cover and so on, and then I make my decision. So a throw-in, the first one, should be a sequential game. So we have found, if we kind of make a table here, uh, it seems that uh, the idea here is to make a table. We have sequential games and we have uh, not enough sick games and simultaneous games. And now we placed we placed penalty kick as a simultaneous game. Okay, so penalty kick is number two should be here, and we have placed uh, a free kick which is four and throw in which is one here. Okay, so we made half of the job now. What about number three here? Where would you place that? Yeah, I agree, Marcus. Good choice. Of course, there's always room for debate here, okay? As long as you argue why you do things, you can uh, actually put anything everywhere, basically, yeah. and still get a right answer. So uh, a dribble is kind of a thing where you... If, if the defender starts waiting to see what your opponent do, then of course you're passed. Okay, so you can't do that. You have to, to kind of take a chance 
in a sense, uh, making up your mind before you observe what to do. So, so uh, a simultaneous game would be a dribble. So three should be here. What about the pass? Of course, a pass is normally played to one of your own players. But it seems reasonable to observe where the player is before you put the pass. We all know about this very advanced football where we make these blind passes, okay? You kind of decide before you pass where you should push it and you hope that your one of your teammates actually are there, okay? That is more like a, a simultaneous game, okay? But uh, normally, uh, when you do don't do these blind passes, you kind of do it sequentially. You kind of watch around, ah, I can put the ball there because there is Tarek, okay? I can. So, uh, so the normal case, a pass would be up here. So there is only one left, one, two, three, four, five, six. I had dual. I would say that I had dual should be here. Simultaneous game. Although, of course, as a defender or as an attacker, you can always not do the high, uh, head duel by wait and see. In that case, there's perhaps not a head duel. Was a big bang here? You think there's terrorists? Absolutely not. No, let's hope. Maybe we should uh, lock the door <laughs> to be on the safe. But there's some windows. It doesn't help, does it? Okay. Are we taping this? Yes, we are. Well, I've been a responsible lecturer. I should perhaps go out now and take cover with you. What do you think? I think they are they are doing some work here, aren't they? They're probably some. Either some um, explosion planned or something which fell down. So this was the kind of answer I expected, I think. But of course, there is always options of placing things differently if one argues for it. <coughs> then there is an allegation again. Kommenter på standen for make comments to the allegation, and this gives so many players some can be thought to take part in a football match. It says here that in game theory, the number of players who takes part in the game is important because finding national equilibrium be becomes much more difficult when the number of players grow. Basically, you don't know this, but um, I have said it in this course that that's the case. And if you start thinking about your simple table here, and if there are three players, there will it will be a cube. There are four players. It will be something you can't draw, and so okay. So it's it's uh, obviously not easier the more players you have. And here you should also discuss how many players can be thought or taking part in a football match. And of course, uh, normally you start thinking, okay, we have the players. There's 11 on one team, 11 on the other. That's 22. Then we might include the referees, which are four. They're up to 26, and then we may start including the coaches and the medical support and maybe even the audience at the pitch and the audience behind the TV screens, and then you get a lot of players. Okay. So as long as there is something in this, um, in this myth about the 12th man, of course the audience plays a part in the match. And most seem to agree that that is the case. There is still some kind of home advantage in football, although it has been diminishing over the latter years. The reason is perhaps that the uncertainty outcome has gone down, so the big best team are better, they are able to perform better away from home. Uh, so uh, this classical home advantage is under pressure, but it's still there. So uh, the idea in C here is to make comments to the allegation. Okay, it seems reasonable that the more players we have, the harder the, it is to solve this, to find national equilibria. And, uh, the number of players in a football match could be either two teams, kind of as we have modeled it very simply, 22, the 22 players, and you then you just add referees, you add everything, sponsor, whatever you like. Okay, so just mention these different categories of groups, we may actually impact what's happening in the game. If the sponsors have put more money onto the match, it could have been that you have been able to p buy a new player, that of course could affect the outcome of a certain match. Okay, D. Now you should kind of look at these sub games and discuss the number of players these may have. Okay. 
If you think about the throw-in, of course, in principle, a throw-in embraces all players of the match. Okay, I, as a, the thrower, could focus on hitting any of my team players, avoiding any of the oppos opposing teams. So basically, all these 22 guys are involved in a throw-in. Okay, of course, but we can model it differently. A penalty kick, we have kind of said, okay, that is two players. But it depends somewhat on what kind of penalty kick it is. If it's a part of a penalty shootout, then there are more than two players. Okay, normally it's the there's one keeper, but there are more than one player who takes a penalty kick which decides on the outcome here. So in that case it would be more than two players. A dribble is in many situations a one against one situation. But of course, uh, following up a dribble, if you should you, you should do something sensible with the ball, either try to dribble more or make a pass and again it kind of embraces more than two players. A free kick, we modeled that when we looked at the model as a dual situation between one team who got the free kick and one team who defended. But again of course maybe that's the reason our model was bad. There are more than two players here. Uh, the choice of how many you put in the wall is, is important when it comes to your defending quality if there is not a sh direct shot. So uh, again, uh, perhaps more than two players. The same with the pass, of course. You can pass to a lot of your own players and the choices of your the oppos opposing team on whether to cover players or not is, is important. So again, typically a 22-player situation. This head duel is perhaps closest to the penalty kick out of these situations, where there typically are two players. But some, in some cases, there are more than two players in a head duel. Although a duel indicates that there are two, doesn't it? There could be a header three or two of the defenders against one of the attackers, which we see uh, in many situations. So the point here is just to, to make a little discussion here. And of course, in the end, every player is a part of the game, even in, in these sub-situations. So, uh, do not overdo these exercises, okay? Try to do them as simple as possible and uh, don't put too much in them, okay? So, exercise two. No, there is a free kick here, isn't it? We have seen the, this one before, I think, in one of the exercises we looked at last time. It should be the same figure, but in this case the figure is actually drawn, which is was not in that exercise, so here you kind of have much more information. The payoffs are distributed among the A team and the D team, and the A team is the attacking team, presumably, and the D team is the defending team. And it says here in figure one, a uh, free kick is modeled as a two-player sequential game. Here, A is the team who has been given the free kick, while D is the defending team. So A means attack and D means defend here, presumably. Each of the teams choose among two possible strategies. The attacking team A can choose a direct shot DS or a pass variant PB, while the defending team D can choose to make a wall W or not a wall and W. It's assumed that the free kick position opens up for a shot possibility. Of course, it's always in principle at any point on the pitch possible to shoot, but if the ball is on our own half, then normally it seems like a bad idea. Okay, so we very seldom see free kicks as direct shots if the ball is, I uh, should say, more than 35 meters from the goal. Okay, it should be a very good shot in order to make a goal at distances of 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or even 100 meters. That is very seldom. We see some goals from the keeper from time to time, but in most of those cases, the, the defending keeper is out of position. Okay. So a defending keeper trying to catch a ball, being shot from 50 or 60 or 70 or more, will typically almost always save the, save the ball, so that has nothing in it. So in order to make this a realistic game, we need to kind of restrict the distance. So from, let's say, 30 and in, then it's, then it's a possibility. So in A, we should discuss whether these payoff values on the right, which are these numbers here, seems reasonable. Okay, then we have to look at them, okay? So let's look here. First here, then the defending team builds a wall. The attacking team makes a direct shot. 
And it seems from the payoff values here that in that case, the attacking team is not very happy because they get zero while the defending team gets two. So it, it should mean in a sense that uh, the point of this wall is to avoid this direct shot option to be kind of a guard of that. And of course, that's the idea. So uh, this doesn't seem unreasonable. Okay, so the, that is kind of why the defending te team puts up a wall here. We can compare this line with this line, because in this line there is no wall and a direct shot. And then, of course, they turn around here. Because you see here now the defending team is not happy while the attacking team is happy. So that seems reasonable. The fact that the payoffs are in this structure along this line and the opposite along this line seems reasonable. So what about the rest here? OK, if we go down here, there is a no wall and a pass. In that case, that is assumed beneficial for the defending team. And the reason is, of course, in this situation, when there is a pass and no wall, the defending team has a lot of players available for defending themselves against this pass. Okay? If there had been a wall, like in this case, a wall and a pass, then we assume that the attacking team is more happy. But you see, there is given a little difference here among a 1 and 0 for these two cases. The reason is perhaps to just make this a game of any value, because if they had been equal, there would be kind of uh, not, at least not a distinct Nash equilibrium. So we were discussing this when we discussed this exercise last time. So the conclusion is the value seems reasonable, although, although of course we can discuss them. They are not unreasonable at least. And then we should find all Nash equilibria in pure strategies on this play and in this game, and that's straightforward. Then we start at the end here. We look at this one first, and then there is a choice for the attacking team either to, to choose the DS option, which gives zero, or the PV option, which gives two, and two is bigger than zero, so two is best. So we, we should kind of put an extra line on this one. Move down here, a DS produces two, a PV produces zero, two is better than zero, so we should have a line here. So now there is a red line here and a red line there. And then we move one stage earlier in the game and look at the defending team. They can choose a W strategy here. In that case, they know that this will happen from the attacking team. And then they ca will get one. Then they have to move from this column up to this column because this is the defending team. Alternatively, if they choose NW here, they still know that DS has been cho chosen from the attacking team, and then they get zero. And you see, this is the reason why we have to separate one and zero. If both were zero here, there will be no solution. So one is better than zero, and they will choose W, and the defending team will choose W, the attacking team will choose pass variant, so we end up with W and PV. So the the only Nash equilibrium of this game is that the defending team chooses to build a wall, while the attacking team chooses a pass variant. OK. We discussed this, that this perhaps is not what we should expect. Okay? Because when we see a wall built, we see a lot of shots. Okay? We don't see only passes. So, uh, but then we argue that there, there must be some problems with the model here. Maybe what I just said recently about that there's probably more than two players. We need a little bit more strategy into what actually happens here before we can see what see reasonable Nash equilibrium. Then we make it a change here. Assume now that the attacking team A has decided to use a practiced, 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 practiced free kick move. Okay, this means you know the meaning of inner attack. That's something you have decided how to do. Okay. So if you, if you choose to do that, then there it should have some impact on the modeling here. And that is being asked about in sub-question C here. Uh, make a decision on the modeling in form of a sequential game still seems sensible in this situation. And then this, this is a leading question, isn't it? The leading here means that maybe it's not sensible anymore. And why is it not sensible anymore? Of course, the point of a sequential game here is that the attacking team should observe how the defending team acts, whether they put up a wall, how many they put in the wall, and how they kind of distribute the rest of their defenders. If you decide on 
an already defined move, then it's not necessary to observe this. Okay, so then you can kind of perhaps more obviously look at this as a simultaneous game, and that is the idea with this question. That you should kind of understand that then in this situation, if you decide what to do, then there's no point in observing the defending team, and then there is suddenly a simultaneous game. And of course that is what you should answer. Maybe it should be a simultaneous game instead in this situation. And of course the next question then is perhaps, yeah, it's actually given here. Assume independent of your answer in, in sub-question C that a simultaneous game only is chosen. So we, you're actually given the answer on sub-question C in D here. So if you are a little bit clever, it should be straightforward to, to, uh, to do this. Uh, and now you're given the option of analyzing this game as a simultaneous game. And of course, then we don't use this game tree, then we use this table. And let's uh, quickly look at the solution here. That's more efficient, perhaps. And you see here we have the... Bah, 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 bah. Here we have the game with all these red lines, as I talked about. They are kind of drawn here. And then uh, we have put up this table. Where we just put in the payoffs 0, 2, 2, 0, 1, 2, 2, 0. And then if we analyze the game, we see here that um, 2 is bigger than 0. 2 is bigger than 0 here, so we get a circle there and a circle there. 2 is bigger than 0, 2 is bigger than 1 there. So we, we see here that there are no sub squares with both a circle and a square. So this is kind of a cause for um, a situation where there are. Uh, mixed strategy in Nash equilibrium, or actually one of those. And that, uh, paradoxically enough, it kind of seems to fit more with reality, doesn't it? Because in this case, there will be some walls, some direct shots, some passing, okay? That's kind of what we really see. So maybe this is a better model after all, although it to some extent doesn't seem as sensible when it comes to the structure here. But this kind of tells us that even in a free kick situation, there's kind of perhaps some kind of combination of simultaneous and, and, uh, and sequential game, which actually takes place. And in those cases, you would expect certain cases with, with mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. As it says here, as figure two uh, tells us, there are no Nash equilibrium pure strategies. You must, uh, in that case, have one and only one in mixed strategies. As, as such, these Yes, it seems as a, a, a simultaneous model is more closer to reality. As we in this case would get some walls, some non-walls, some direct shot and some passes. Okay, so kind of what we really expect or actually really observe. Okay, and then there was a final question here, which kind of ends our talk for today. I think this was not the right exercise. Maybe this was the right. No, maybe this. Yeah. Finally, assume that the free kick which is given to the attacking team notice at the shooting distance on your own half. And that the previous situation with the, the, the practice move is not longer judged as an alternative. How should the Nash equilibrium look in this case? Try to change the payoff value values of figure 1 such that your guess fits with the Nash equilibrium you find by analyzing the changed game. Okay? Now, this may perhaps be hard to understand what I mean here. The idea is very simple, okay? Now we move the free kick away from the goal into our own half, okay? And we know that when we have a free kick in our own half, we know what happens, don't we? Then we always pass the ball and there are no walls. Okay, that's what happens. If you get a free kick on your own half, you always pass the ball. You can shoot a long pass or a short pass, but uh, your opponent never make a wall. So you know the structure of the Nash equilibrium, don't you? The Nash equilibrium should contain a pass variant and no wall. Okay, so it should be containing the PV and no wall. Okay, so the question is, can we change the values now in our initial original game such that we end up with these as the solution? That's what you're asked to do here. Okay. 
So let me show you how that can be done. So it says here, yeah. So there should be n WPV, no wall in the past. That is what we observe. And how can we change the numbers? It says it's easy enough to manipulate the numbers in the uh, original game to achieve this equilibrium. It's enough to change in the lower left zero with the three. It says here. Let's see what happens then. Lower left zero with the three. Okay. So here it is. It says that this one, if we put a 3 in instead of a 0 here, then we achieve what we get. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Let's check it, okay? Let's do that before we stop today. In order to kind of be able to do this exercise, of course, you need to realize that what you see in real life here is this Nash equilibrium here. Okay, you have to understand that. Okay, that we need to know so much football and have se or have seen so much football that that there are no walls if you get the free kick close to your own 16 meters. Okay, then you typically either play a pass to the keeper or s or up front in some way or another. So let's look at this situation now. W and W. We have the attacking team, uh, direct shot or passing, direct shot or passing, and my suggestion was to not change this one, not change the second one, not change this one, but to put a tree in here. Okay, let's see what happens then. We start here again, direct shot, zero, pass two, this is best, okay? So we get this one here, don't we? Two is better than zero. Then we go down here, direct shot, two, pass, two is better than zero. No, that's not, is it? Something happens here, doesn't it? Three is bigger than two, so we suddenly get it here now instead. This one is flipped down here. Okay, we move in front here. Walling up produces a pass variant which gives one. Okay, down here we get here. No, we don't get here. So two, two is bigger than one. So now you suddenly choose this one, don't you? Based on this change, that's exactly what we wanted to achieve. And W P V now is the Nash equilibrium in the, of this game by changing this zero into a three. Of course, there's a lot of different ways you can do this, but this is just one example on how to achieve whether it's sensible, of course, is another thing. But uh, at least it has must have some impact logically here, this change of zero from zero to three here on, uh, on the meaning of, of, of the free kick, so to speak. At least we got now the Nash equilibrium we wanted. That was kind of the, the only point here. But you need some certain creativity here to be able to solve this task. The, the, the first half, of course, is to realize that this should be the Nash equilibrium. Then the next question is, how can we change numbers here to get that Nash equilibrium? It could be done in many ways, many other ways than this. But this is one example of how to achieve it. A nicer way would be, OK, no, this free kick is different. So we have to change the logic underlying here in a much more direct way than just changing one number. Of course, it's easiest to change one. And as long as that's the only question we get here, in a sense, we are asked, then we can try to do it as easy as possible. OK. This was the first exercise here. Now there are two exercises left here, and there's one left for tomorrow. So I think we stop here, OK, and continue with the rest of these, as well as the final one, uh, tomorrow. Okay, so that ends this lecture of today. Yeah, uh, th this is something we haven't looked at yet. It's uh, another exercise here. No, we finished exercise two, didn't we? Yeah, so there's only one exercise left. Exercise three. Where does that start? Ah, it starts here. 
yeah so it's uh, a little bit more than one exercise left for tomorrow so we will probably finish in two hours in tomorrow as well but if you have any questions tomorrow is the day to ask them okay at least in class so have a nice day <laughs>